What's happening, everybody? Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of What Is It? We don't know. That's what we're here to talk about. We do this. Uh, we try to do this monthly, get together with uh, these three fine gentlemen to talk about bands and albums and styles of music that kind of uh, don't really fit anywhere too nicely, that kind of cross lines of different types of genres. Today is no exception. We're going to talk about this thing called pomp rock. But before we do, let me introduce the crew. Mr. Brendan Snyder is here. How's it going? Grant Arthur is here. And Mr. Scott Laid is here. Prod Corner, Brendan Snyder, Grant's Rock Warehouse, Contrarians, and Sea of Tranquility all colliding here on this particular show. Good morning, gentlemen. We're all right in. Morning. Nice to see everybody. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So uh, we've done a couple episodes in this series so far, and uh, I think they've been very successful, and we've enjoyed talking about these bands. So today we're going to specifically talk about uh, a few bands that fall under this term of pomp rock. And we've kind of already hinted at this before because we've talked about sticks before and yeah. we've talked about some other bands that kind of fall into Star Castle. Star mm -hmm. Castle, right? This, you know, yeah. Kansas, maybe to an extent, right? So sure. I'm going to read a little something here. And I got this melodic rock website up here that I think describes it really, really uh, clearly. Uh, a subgenre overview of what pomp rock is. According to the Oxford Dictionaries, no. Okay. Pop rock is a genre of rock music, especially prevalent in the late 70s and early 80s, typically characterized by prominent keyboards and drums and heavy use of guitar effects, often regarded as bombastic or grandiose in its delivery. Earliest use is attributed to British weekly pop rock music newspaper Melody Maker in the 70s. The term was used mainly by the British music press to identify symphonic progressive rock played by American bands. In the U.S., these bands usually were, were labeled AOR. Thus, pop rock is a subgenre of symphonic progressive rock. Kansas and Sticks are perhaps the best known representatives, but there are a lot of more obscure bands that are also well worth checking out. And they say it's the missing link between symphonic rock and adult oriented rock. Yeah, so I, would rock I would agree with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. So specifically for this particular episode, we're going to center on just a handful of bands. We've got uh, from Canada, we've got the band Zahn. We've got uh, from the U.S. of A. We've got Aviary. Oh, got, yeah. from the U.K. Uh, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> from the U.K., we've got the Great Magnum. Yeah. Uh, also from the U.S., we've got New England, and then also from the U.S., probably one of the bands that I think we talk about the most when we talk about this style of music, Angel. Right. So uh, I don't know where we want to start. Should we start alphabetical here? I guess that's Angel, right? I guess yeah. that would be. <laughs> yeah. So Punky Meadows and Frank Domino and crew. I, I don't think anybody would argue that these first two albums in their catalog, which is self-titled and hell of a band, probably the most indicative of this style, probably the most prog rock-ish of their albums. Whereas maybe some of the ones that come after a little bit more and just like a hard rock, uh, almost glam metal type of a style. But, you know, you've got Greg Jafria's keyboards all over these albums. It's big. It's bombastic. It's melodic. You've got epics on here. You know, I normally rate these as my two favorite Angel albums. It usually comes the debut and then Hell of a Band is number two. What do you guys think of these albums? And do, does this really qualify as pop rock? Oh, yeah, it's pop rock all the way through. I mean, this was like as a kid, right? Uh, you encountered this band uh, primarily if you were a Kiss fan. And uh, if you like look at the record. footprint of Kiss on this whole pop rock thing, it's, it's kind of weird, right? Because you had uh, the Casablanca connection uh, with Angel. But how about New England? which we're going to talk about in a minute and Paul Stanley being involved with that. But Angel was discovered by Gene Simmons, yep. uh, apparently. And uh, this to me as a little kid, when I first heard this first Angel album, uh, it blew me away because I liked Kiss, but I wanted a little more musicality. But I still liked that really big sound that would appeal to a 13 year old kid. And uh, oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> oh, I got the band I was looking for right here. And you're right, the first two albums are the ones. Uh, although the third and fourth albums aren't bad, right? We'll find that. There's not, a, there's not a bad album in this kind On Earth, yeah. uh, you know, what, 1977, White Hot. Seven, th those are good albums, right? 
But uh, the first two just just hit the nail. The bullseye of what pop rock should be. And uh, it is the keyboards being front and center, not afraid to, you know, have them uh, real high in the mix where later on I felt like they uh, they schmaltzed it up and brought them down in the mix at the same time. And it wasn't as effective. But, yeah, the first two Angel albums, kind of the definition of pop rock to me. Yeah. Grant, do you I love, you I love them both, man. I just, oh, they're both great. Great. Uh, they're all great. I think doesn't Martin like he's not a big fan of the first two. I think he likes the later stuff, but that's Martin. I know. But I think the first two albums are brilliant, but I think they encompass a lot of different styles into one thing. Because how come on, we're 1975. There's a lot of Mellotron on that first record. Yeah. You know, and it's it's def I, I really it's hard to classify. Yeah, it's pop rock, but it's also prog. It's also glam, if you look at it. Look how those bit. guys dress. Yeah. I was just going to ask you that with the with the white outfits, right? The flowing robes. I mean, they're it's totally from they that. They check a lot of different boxes, <laughs> yeah. but I I do think that the debut is five out of five, ten out of ten, and hell of a band's right up there. But it's still not it's not quite the debut. But they just kept what do I want to say? Kind of. As they kept going, they just kind of refined themselves and just became more of a hard rock metal band to some degree. But they always had that element. But uh, there's not anything weak in the catalog, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. No. Even the I mean, 2019 album. Yeah. The right. most recent ones are very good, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's that's where I was going to go with it, that the, the band itself has had so many different genres and styles that they've played in, certainly starting mm -hmm. off in the more progressive rock realm of things and moving into the air war and the uh pump rock and all that sort of stuff but by the time you get to this here it's sort of like well what is this um it still has those elements but this doesn't sound anything like the debut i mean this this sounds like yeah. two entirely different bands here yet they still fit within the the category so to speak and so in looking at all of these it's you know if if a band puts out, I don't know how many albums did, did they do seven or so albums here, eight, eight total. Mm -hmm. Then if only two of them are prog or only two of them are pump, it, are they a pump rock band? Are they a progressive rock band? If they did hard rock AOR and they did these other things. So it's sort of like, I think for me, Angel always felt more like a hard rock band in the broader spectrum of all of their albums. Uh, but there's some that definitely lean more towards uh, prog and uh, pomp rock and whatnot. But I always like these two albums, uh, the ones that came later, you know, in the um, era. But those were the more hard rock straight ahead. And I think that's what got me into them. But I was like you guys uh, coming into it because of the Casablanca kiss, you know, relation and looking for more of that. And the progginess of it was like, wait, what's this? I'm going to stick with the hard rock stuff. And then I've kind of come around. Uh, mm. to the rest of their styles but so i've often the, talked about and i've been wanting to ask brendan this question uh, leading up to this episode so i've always felt that angel were a band that were a little too early to the game and that's the reason why they never got as big as they probably should have because i i you have to wonder if you listen to their music and maybe not so much the first two albums but definitely the two you just held up and all the the, the albums that came out in the 80s and their look and the yep. way they weave their great melodies and things like that. As someone who I know is a big fan of like the glam metal and, and hair metal scene here in the States during the 80s, don't you feel a little bit that if Angel came out and debuted probably in 81, 82 or whatever and released these same albums in that time period that they would have been massive? I absolutely do, completely. Because, I mean, you look at Jufria, the band that Greg Jufria did after mm -hmm. that, and then House of Lords. Yeah. Uh, but it, by that point, they're too late to the game. Yes. Right? So had Angel come sooner in that, and I would say, yeah, man, if they had dropped an album like 83 uh, there to start, I, I do. I think they would have been one of the big ones. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think so. I think they were they were too late to the prog game and too early to everything that came afterwards. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. They were, they were a couple of years too late for those early Angel albums to, to really hit the target audience they were starting to move on so the proggy edge of those first two albums maybe a couple years too late and you're right what they turned into that very visual look 
that they had would have been tailor made for the 80s, man. Yeah. You know, their uh, first album would have dropped an 82 or 83, like Brandon said. Yeah, they could have been ginormous, but I think we're giving Casablanca a little bit too much credit also. Um, they were actually bumbling idiots, and uh, overall, they had absolutely no idea what they were doing. Uh, they got so enormously lucky that they uh, had uh, Kiss and Kiss money to throw around, but uh, that wasn't through any skill of their own. Uh, that was through uh, the vision of the band themselves, and uh, yeah, I, I hear a lot of times that yeah, Angel could have been this, and I and I think the label uh, takes a little bit of blame, and we're gonna see that. As we talk about a lot of these bands, Pete Pardo, yeah. is that the labels mismanaged pretty much every one of these bands. They didn't know how to handle them. They didn't know how to market them. So yeah. uh, it's going to be a recurring theme. And I think a lot of it comes down to the visuals. I think had Angel not had the matching white outfits and tried to be so <laughs> pretty, they were the antithesis of what Kiss were. And that was a whole thing they were pushing on them. Uh, and it had, it had been just let's listen to the music and have guys come out in regular outfits and things like that. They might have gotten a little more um, sort of credibility or, yeah. you know, or, or not lost in their appearance. Yeah, for sure. Did, did sure. they get much push or promotion from Casablanca or were they pretty much just putting all their I, money I into Donna Summer and but... Kiss? Yeah. I don't remember much promotion with Angel. I mean, I remember seeing Angel appearing in the magazines at the time, you know, Circus mm -hmm. and Hip Parader and Cream and stuff like that. But I, I don't, I don't think they were getting the muscle behind them like Kiss was. Yeah, um, for sure. So I, I don't know. It, well, it's what, yeah. but they also wasn't there a story though that Kiss did not want them to open on their tours because they would just, it was like competition. that would have made perfect sense, right? Yeah. I, I believe it. I haven't heard that story, but uh, I've heard plenty of Something other out there. stories and it, 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 sl it slides right into it perfectly. Maybe it was Paul Stanley just felt threatened or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, Gene worked. discovered him, but, you know, I don't think Paul was totally on board because it's like a different you know. sound, really. I mean, you got the technical yeah. prowess of, of these guys versus Kiss just coming out and doing three chord rock. And if you looked at a lot of the advertisements at the time, it would always reference Kiss in relation to these guys. And yet they sounded nothing alike. Yeah. So I think it would, you know, promoting it to the Kiss fans was probably not the right direction either in this. Right. Yeah, and I think it was just timing on this. Yeah. It's too, yeah. It was too late and it should have been way earlier. It should have came out like 73, yeah. might have had more of a right. chance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. whatever, it is what it is. Right. <laughs> you know, Scott mentioned the whole thing about record labels dropping the ball. Mm -hmm. You have to think in 1979, Sony should have ran with this thing. Uh, the the self-titled debut from Aviary. Brilliant. So good. Brilliant. Like, what happened? Nice. I, ne I never even oh, heard of right this there. back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They got the look. You know, this is a time where Journey is really starting to become popular. You got Foreigners, a big band at the time. Like, what happened here? Like this is a gorgeous, gorgeous album. Yeah, this is 79. A little too late, probably. Right? Yeah, probably a little too late. You know, you got you got the de facto uh, frontman rock star and Brad Love. I mean, just look at this dude. He's got star written all over him. 1977. I think it would have done a lot better, or even yeah. earlier. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Same I thing. think I think these guys were led down a primrose path. Uh, by a guy who is cl clearly starting to lose touch with the realities of the music business. Mm -hmm. By 1979, uh, Brian Lane had established himself as this guru in the music industry, having guided Yes to these uh, incredible heights. And I think they became mesmerized by whatever Brian said. And uh, I, I think the album was actually maybe a little too proggy for 1979. It, it, it really felt a little bit... Uh, uh, dated in 79 although listening to it now uh in 2024 it's an amazing album it came out a right. couple years too late absolutely uh it didn't do anything and they still listened to what brian had to tell him i guess they they moved to the uk after this album flopped in the u.s uh they changed their name to the curves and they go on tour with the stranglers uh oh, trying to rebrand the whole thing um, 
just a whole, just a mess. But you go back and you listen to this album. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, it is it's incredible. It is such a fantastic album. But at the time when I heard it, um, I really didn't care for it. It, it, it felt like a relic back in '79. It, it, it kind of did, and I and I and I think I blame uh, you know Brian Lane a whole bunch for that and and his uh, management. But uh, I doubt I. <laughs> I started working in the music industry at, uh, at the retail level in 1980. Uh, so I don't really remember how much uh, support CBS gave this thing, but I don't remember no. a peep about it. No, not at all. Go, go on Discogs and look up the Aviary <laughs> album. They're all promos. Yeah. I don't know. Scott, do you ever remember it being in the store? Yeah, look, they're all promos. <laughs> I don't know if it ever was in a record store. But it's no, no, I it's found brilliant. it years later, never knew about them at the time, uh, kind of a thing. I also think that, like in, in this particular instance, the label didn't stand behind them long enough mm. to actually have them do the second album, the third album, develop that sound, push it. They immediately decided to, let's rebrand you, let's take you to the UK and do something else. And yeah, yeah. you're showing me the second album there that while recorded later was stuff that should have been a second album well, right. that was all recorded between 75 and 79 yeah yeah this is all stuff that they would have used for a proposed second album which never really happened and there's some brilliant stuff on here you know obviously this is this is the great debut but there's right. still some excellent stuff on here and it very much sounds like it. this and yeah. you know you've on this album you've got these soaring vocal harmonies uh, it's like Queen. It's like, you know, 10 yeah, CC and you've got loads of Mellotron and really tasty guitar work. And uh, you listen to some of these, like the song Soaring, that should have been. Uh, awesome yeah. yeah. The song's awesome. is amazing. Uh, it's been been huge. Anthem for the USA. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. There's not a track on here that's weak. It is. I love it. It, As far as I'm concerned, if we're talking about all these records, this is my favorite one. Yeah. I absolutely love it. And it just has killer art on it. If it I saw the records art. were back in the day, I would have grabbed this thing, flip it yeah, over. But, you see the guys. But that wasn't the album cover. In well, that, the I know, US, they the, went, they they reversed it. They went with yeah, that's this. what was on the vinyl at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is what and then the, the they used that as the back. Ah. The yeah. No, so I've never cool. seen the back. That's pretty cool too, though. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. Well, does that have like an inner sleeve in it? Does it have any of that artwork? That yeah, so where, yeah. Where does this come from? Yeah, where's where does that come from? <laughs> yeah, the inner oh, sleeve okay. has some some of that. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, I love it. I don't know, but yeah, when I find, I came across that album, it was solely the album cover that made me take note. And then I looked at the date on it and the guys on the back, and I said, "Yeah, this is going to be up my alley. I'll take a shot on it." And I'm so glad that I did. And but Pete said of- uh, something about Brad, right? Brad, he looks like a rock and roll star, don't he? Oh, yeah. Well, I understand why you'd probably want to put Brad on the album cover. I, <laughs> I certainly get it. But, you know, right. again, if this record had come out during the age of MTV, uh, I could have marketed this cat the same way they marketed John Bon Jovi. Right. You know, he could have been huge. What a great, great album this is. If you guys yeah. haven't heard it, uh that aviary album is stellar i give it nine and a half out of ten i really oh, do. i give it a 10 out of 10 you... and Solid. it's a great logo yes the only thing maybe it was the album cover they kind of look like the band tycoon it's kind of <laughs> not really but you see what i mean maybe yeah. it, i don't know what it was yeah. but they had such a great logo i just think it's timing timing yeah. again 1979 and that's coming out timing heard him yeah I mean, yeah. Queen was doing jazz then, so it's still in that wheelhouse. But I think it's too late. But is that a great know, name? Aviary? Okay. Yeah. Is that a great that name? Logo. For a I don't know. Great logo. Yeah. I don't know. With with the album art and the bird and yeah. the plane, yes. But with that, maybe not. Maybe people right. that's what I'm thinking. Connect. You know, you, you know what it is because Brendan, the, the CD album art there is kind of got this hypnosis look to it, which was yeah. big at the time. Right, a, a shot of the band on the front, eh, maybe not so much. Right, oh, even as cool leopard. as they look, they're wearing leopard print, which is cats, not birds. Maybe if they had bird feathers on and called themselves Avery, it would have worked better. Who knows? But I, well, I, I want to say that I'm envious of you, Pete, because you have that second 
yeah. album on CD and that's I expensive. Know. But I went on Spotify because I'm got to hear it. And it's just, it's darn near as good. Yeah, good. And, and think about it. Those were outtakes or stuff they didn't use. Yeah. Imagine what it could have turned into. Go check it out, please. And I keep boosting about this. I always talk about aviary. I'm doing these listening parties. If we do something, I always play the aviary because I'm trying to, it's just so brilliant. So I will say for those watching <sighs> don't have this or haven't heard this, if you can go and, and sample some stuff here on YouTube, whatever, go listen to the song. Hello. It sounds yeah. like electric light orchestra. It's great. Oh, wow. And then go listen to desert song slash Pharaoh's March. It's the big Epic on the album. Killer. Absolutely killer. There's some oh. great stuff on here. Ambition is really good too. It's a really good album. Really good. Hello, me. Really recommend so too. Yeah, I think that's out of all the bands we're talking about today. I think if you if you're not familiar with Aviary, you really should go listen to that debut album. It's pretty damn special. Yep. So, all right, we're gonna move up in the uh, alphabet alphabetical list here. Let's go to Magnum, right? So this is a band that has been around since what the early '70s. I think they really got yeah. their start. '72, yeah. I think they were. Yeah. Cool. So Pretty this is early. kind of the oddball of the bands we're talking about a little earlier. Yeah, a little yeah. early, but they didn't release their first album until late in the decade. And that was uh, Kingdom of Madness, which is a killer, killer album. And this is a band. I mean, I've been following Magnum forever and I've got pretty much everything they've ever done. They've got 20 some odd albums and they literally. When 23, you, I counted. Yeah, that's a lot. Wow. They are pop rock. Because mm -hmm. they are, they have all these little elements that we talked about here. They've got that hard rock muscle. They've got the big bombastic symphonic proggy element, and then really they're just great at like creating wonderful vocal mm -hmm. melodies. I mean, so many good albums. But you just held up Kingdom of Madness. So, what is your? Which is the right album cover? Uh, I do not believe this is the original. Okay. I don't. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know either. This this one came in a in a Magnum box set. That yeah, they that, did, uh, recently compiled. you might have the very original one. I know this has been the album cover for a while, but I, I don't yeah. know. But they've got they've got some great album covers, you know, other than maybe Magnum Two. Well, yeah. See, then you held that one up, and then see, this is oh. this is Magnum Two, the one you yeah. were just holding up. I like your album cover much yeah. better. Than when I saw this one, I was like, that would grab my eye. But the one that you held up, the same yeah. album, not so yeah. much. So, you know, they, they had that a lot, I found, different album art for different territories. And I wonder how much of that affected, um, I don't know, getting the attention, right? Did they Should they really have been changing the album art between territories? Well, I've heard people say over the years that as, as great as some of these Rodney Matthews album covers are, and they are really good, yeah. that this lends itself oh this is a this is like roger dean this is like a prog album these really aren't prog albums they have magnum always had proggy elements but at their core this was just a great melodic rock band who right. has big symphonic arrangements hence the whole pop rock thing yeah. and I'm, I'm amazed the quality of the entire magnum catalog has such great quality whether you're getting into the early early stuff or you just go and buy like the last the stuff they've done in the last 20 years, there's no dip in quality at all. The, the album they just released earlier this year before Tony Clark and their guitar player and songwriter died is yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to, to that. RIP to him, man. Oh, he was, he was the man, right? You know, I mean, you, you think of the voice of this band, which of course is amazing. Uh, but Tony Clarkin oh. is the guy writing all these songs, writing all these vocal melodies and and writing all the riffs and playing all the riffs i mean he's they can't continue without him no i mean you need bob you need tony i mean bob, bob catley has an amazing voice at uh, what late 70s he still sounds great he's very distinctive but he'd be the first and if you read when tony died and you read the, the letter that bob wrote or watched the video he basically said that everything that i've done so well throughout my career is attributed to tony he wrote all these vocal melodies for me we yeah. can't do this band without him and that's it right it's a shame. That, that is, is a real shame because I hadn't yet heard that uh, essentially they're going to retire. I thought maybe, you know, get a different guitar player and at least still perform live to keep the legacy going. But um, no, I, the whole thing is Tony Clarkin. So, yes, yeah, sometimes it just feels wrong. I mean, yeah. well, to, this to replace a member. Yeah, <laughs> that's one. That well, Brenda, did, Brenda, did you say you have the box set? Uh, yeah, there was a, a six CD box set that they six. put out. 
um, the great adventures, the jet year, 78 to 83. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be stuff. a yeah, good that's, collection. That's worth getting right there. Cause I mean, yeah. all, I mean, that's basically like $35 too. So it's yeah. like Much, a really it, good deal. What like the day produced, I mean, did they self-release that? What's that? Who put that out? Oh, no, it's um, H&E records from okay. the UK. Okay. Uh, this just came out last year. Uh, I believe it, it doesn't say the date on, yeah, 2023. It's on the back. So awesome. it's, it should still be available. I highly recommend this because yeah. you're also getting all the original album art, or at least as to I understand it, uh, the original album art with it. But um, for me, man, this is my favorite album, and it's probably oh, the great, froggy man. sounding album. It's a it's a more um, not metal, but it definitely goes in that vein. And those early albums, it seemed like each album, they tried a different style to kind of figure out who they were. You know, they did the proggy, they did the AOR, the melodic rock, you know, they tried all that sort of stuff. I don't know that I would put this band in the prog rock or even the pump rock category, but AOR, melodic rock, absolutely. But again, I'm looking at it as the totality of their catalog. Um, I got into them through this album in 88, which this one here is full on AOR. Oh, I yeah. wouldn't call this uh, proggy at all. So my mind might be a little jaded. Yeah. I found a record of this. And again, I look at the, the front cover with the guys and I said, 1988, and it's on Polydor. I said, these guys are going to be right up my alley, my uh, cup of tea. And sure enough, they were. And then I branched out from there. Couldn't believe how far back they went into the seventies and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but every album is good. I have not gotten a bad Magnum album. You could start anywhere, present day, beginning, or anywhere in the middle. If you just find a copy for all those people watching, you find a copy used in a store, pick it up. It's going to yeah. be good. They are the poster child for uh, veteran, longstanding bands who are releasing some of their best material in the later part of the catalog because th I, I tell you i've rated like every one of their last like eight to ten albums as like 4.5 out of five or five out of five star albums just that they're that good yeah. they're really Can't good argue with that yeah. well they were yeah. virtually unknown here in the states they didn't yeah oh, you know they're totally a you know uk band they didn't yeah. really do it, anything it, it at all their breakthrough album you know for the u.s and even that is not that big within their catalog you know, this was recorded in the States. It was uh, done with all the intention, the right producers, everyone, you know, and did okay, but it didn't, didn't break them big, didn't take You know, we up. talked about their cover art and uh, I think that's part of the confusion. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people had about the band. I mean, you go from what uh, Brendan just held up to, you know, the Rodney Matthews stuff. It's like, I mean, look, look at this. Guys, yeah, this right. Cool. What are these guys supposed to sound like? That it's looks like, like a nice Christian cover. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like a death metal but, album cover. That's yeah, like a death. It's so. It, this you're is looking like and you're going through the bins. You're going. Album cover, one. So. And then you go yeah, back to the froggy stuff on a yeah. storyteller's night, right. you know, where you're like, okay, you know, demons, fantasy, right? But, uh, you know, early 2000s. Yeah, what is that? It, it's all different. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that hurt them, especially in the US market where we yeah. didn't know who they were to start with. And now you got all this confusion with the discography and the, right. the branding of the band. Uh but yeah, I haven't heard all 23 albums. I've probably heard half of them. And I agree, yeah, I, haven't. I haven't heard a bad one yet. No. Nope. I'm very new to this band. In fact, I until we were doing this episode, I'd never paid attention. That's how obscure they wow. were for me. Okay. But I have a question since we're talking about it. Were these, was this band, were their albums released domestically or were they just like imports? Did they ever have, no, they did, did. were they ever signed to anybody here in the States? Yeah, to Polydor. Okay. They were well, still signed. To, I don't know that the early, early albums like that. No, the early stuff was import. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Was it all import? But by yeah. early 80s, they, they were signed to, a U, to the U.S. version of Polydor and put a number of albums out. Mm -hmm. Good night, LA. Uh, fault, which was the follow up to this one. I don't have that one in my uh, hand, but from 1990 uh, on Polydor, and it got got a good push. But that that title always confused me because I thought it was a live album. Yeah, Good yeah. night, LA. So I steered clear of it for the longest time. Finally picked it up, and I was like, oh, it's not a live album; it's studio. <laughs> you know. So I think it's a, it's a combination of just a whole bunch of little missteps that added up into them not uh, 
getting a proper due, a proper shot at it. And the yeah. biggest misstep is they never toured here. Yeah. And that I think they only toured them. here once or twice early on. Yeah. You, you can't expect to, especially back in the in the eighties and the early nineties, if you're not playing live here to people, uh, and the the labels aren't going to push your your music, the stores aren't going to push it. It's just that's right. Yeah, and if you're not getting on MTV or any of the other uh, yeah. type of music channels, I mean, and they all, and that's a good point. And they also, let's be real here, they didn't have the look for MTV either. I mean, they look like old geezers back in the day, right? Yeah, it's, it's hard to see, but he's got a full-on crazy man beard. Yeah, the beard, <laughs> the hat. Tony wore the hat, right? It's a little you know, early for that crazy man beard. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like yeah. it's a pretty boy and crazy man beard. <laughs> yeah, I think musically, they. I mean, I, I listen to some of those '80s albums and like, God, why was this album not huge? Especially here when you yeah. had, had bands like you know. Uh, Journey and Foreigner and Loverboy and all that, play, you know Bon Jovi doing this you know soaring melodic rock hard rock stuff and Magnum stuff is as good as any of that but right in yeah for here they didn't get pushed by the label um they didn't have the look they weren't doing videos right it's right yeah it's a shame it's a shame yeah, but yeah. You know, over in Europe they were they're a fairly big band so but I think I think their biggest thing I mean it's all of that but that they changed the sound on almost each record. Each record had a slightly, you know, one, you know, more progressive, more AOR, try a pop record, you know, try a straight ahead rock record, because they were really grasping at straws. So if you were a fan of a previous one and had really liked something or they got a hit on the radio, the follow up didn't match that formula. The first thing that broke through for them was on a storyteller's night. But yeah. the follow up album after this was nowhere near this. This, yeah. I would say, is Prague, but the follow up album was not. Um, so well, and probably alienated some fans maybe because they probably expected a certain thing and these guys kept morphing I right. don't know if they were one of those bands where if you're a Magnum fan you'll do, you're will do you in whatever they do you know it's kind of like Todd Rundgren those Todd Rundgren fans will follow Todd to the end of the earth right. whatever right. he wants to do but yeah. was Magnum one of those bands? Just throwing it out there. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think they uh, would establish a small bit of fan base and then lose that each mm -hmm. time on it. But um, as, as you, you guys have each kind of attributed to saying that uh, they're one of the few bands who is doing some of their best work now. You know, there's no bad albums. They're, they're fantastic for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think retroactively, despite all the changing within their styles throughout, they're one of those bands you can go back now, have a bigger clout today, because you can take it as a totality of styles, as opposed to at the time when you heard this, and then it changed to this and changed to this. You know, so like looking back at, at Bowie or looking back at Neil Young, those guys changed on every album mm -hmm. um, who had more success doing it. But I mean, look at the whole catalog of, of any artist that's doing that. And I think Magnum gets more respect today uh, for that. Yeah, no and doubt. Think, Some artists are like that. Where the, the sum is greater than each individual part. Rundgren, yeah. perfect example of that. Bowie, yeah, perfect Young, example. Perfect, yeah. Yeah. I think Magnum, the only time in their real career where they kind of hit on a formula and kind of stuck with it is the more recent stuff. Like most of their more recent albums, they're all sound, they have a similar sound to them, but each album is filled with such great memorable songs that you don't care that they're just kind of rehashing the formula uh, album after album after album. And really it works in that instance, right? You don't feel like you're getting the exact same thing over and over. So, all right, let's move on to uh, up the alphabet. Uh, let's go to New England. So it's a, uh, a U.S. band. We're going back to the U.S. Very cool band. Like you said, discovered by uh, one of the guys in Kiss. Paul Stanley. And that rock candy rock right there that Brendan's got. It's kind of nice. What, what's your What's your copy? The Mine is the Renaissance Records one, which I don't know okay. how that is. Is right? that How's that sound? You got an I'm original on vinyl? It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Where, yeah, where's the copy, Grant? Come on. I got it, but it, I'd have to okay. go pull it. And I don't want to have to deal with that. That's all right. You let us uh, do the swag. Mine's, uh, okay. Yeah, the I one need I've got is Rock Candy. One. And then second record's Rock Candy. And then the third one, I think, is a Japanese import. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't found the third one yet. So it, this was a band that up until our last video where you guys mentioned we would be doing this, I didn't have any in my collection and never paid attention to them, really. And you mentioned it, and I thought, 
they're Prague. I, I never, I had no idea. I didn't get that sense from them. Had never really listened to them all that much. Found this one first mm -hmm. and listening to its second album mm -hmm. and thought, listening to this, I was like, this isn't Prague. This is, you know, AOR melodic rock. It's a bit of pop in it kind of a thing. And then later I found this one. And I said, oh, this is Prague. <laughs> this is, this is why everyone's it. calling it that, which the interesting thing is this is the one that Paul Stanley uh, is involved in. And it's so different. I would have thought it would have been this one that leaned in the more pop direction of things. But I'm really, really enjoying these uh, really two good, albums. I can't wait to find the third one. Um, and I always thought it was interesting that um, Jimmy Waldo and Gary Shea um, who would go on to Alcatraz. Yeah. And that was the thing that, that caught me about this. When I first looked into it, and I didn't know anything about it, you know, following mm -hmm. our last video. And I looked it up and I go, what? I love Alcatraz and I love Jimmy Waldo's keyboards. And now, of course, I don't think that's what, what is in this here. However, it made me interested to go back and check it out. But just kind of surprising right. that those two guys came from a, mm -hmm. a prog the uh you know aor band to then doing metal with alcatraz graham bonnet and all that sort of graham stuff. bonnet and steve yeah. by well, I mean, <laughs> come on man uh, but i guess i mean alcatraz. if you can do the the proggy um pump rock thing which is a technical thing then dealing with ingve malmstein you know, and his guitar and what he's doing and steve vi it actually makes sense just two different genres of stuff but um i highly yeah. recommend these two this uh, uh, this year everybody talks about uh paul stanley's involvement he is credited as co-producer but uh if you want to think about pomp rock and the sound of pomp rock his other co-producer is probably a little bit more responsible for helping shape the sound of this year record that's Mike Stone, man. I mean, if you listen to the Asia album from a couple of years later and listen to this, and it's like, I, I see the through line there for sure. Uh, it's what a fantastic album good. this is, though. Yeah, he's, I, he's produced that, yeah. I, yeah. I, just, I just love the sound of this thing. It sounds actually, unlike a lot of the records we're talking about that are in this time frame, this actually kind of felt like it was pointing towards uh, the future a little bit. It didn't sound dated. It sounded fresh. Uh, there was a song called P-U-N-K on here, right? It was awesome, man. Had the big hit, right? They had a big top 40 hit on here. Uh, the third album was produced by Todd Rundgren. Uh, so these guys had everything set up for them. Uh, but what was it? Infinity Records. Is that the, is that the problem? But, <laughs> it was well, Infinity that's what there was on originally. And didn't Infinity fold or they got bought up by... Yeah, and why did Infinity fold, Grant? Infinity folded because they spent $3 million uh, helping produce, finance, market, manufacture, and ultimately have to pay a bundle in return product on Pope John Paul II's album. What? So New England <laughs> got done in by the Pope. Oh, man. Well, the Pope yeah, was very been... popular then. Yes. yes. <laughs> He's very popular. <laughs> oh wow. oh damn. this record i think is just phenomenal yeah. what about that debut single don't ever want to lose you Come oh, great on. Song. got great. to number 40 and yeah. if you think about it it is catchy as can be i never hear that track anymore though but my god it's infectious this whole album is infectious but i think I it's I remember, 1979 what's that it's 1979 yeah i know I, all I these know, bands but... It's just, too it's late. a little too early, 1981. And I think that yeah. song would have been huge. We'd still hear it on classic rock radio. But 1979. Right before MTV. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It would have you know, they were banking, you know, New England opened up for Kiss on that tour. And mm -hmm. I think they were banking on them getting the rub, but um didn't quite happen. It doesn't yet. always work out. No, it doesn't always work. Because you know how many, you know, this is a, these are KISS fans, right? How many yeah. people back in this day and age were like, oh, who's opening? New England? Never heard of them. I'll hang out outside in the parking lot or whatever at the bar until KISS was get ready to go on stage, which is kind of a shame because I think there's a lot of greatness happening in this band. You guys, uh, you know, especially with Aviary and Angel and New England, do you get like this kind of kinship with the way that they created the vocal harmonies? Yeah. And again, we're hearing elements of 
Queen and 10 CC and other, you know, maybe City Boy, because City Boy also could be floated into this whole conversation as well. ELO, certainly. The way that these bands are creating these vocal harmonies with this very good guitar work and Mellotron and the big symphonic keyboards. I mean, that's what pop is all about, right? The pop Queen and sticks. Symphonic right? and sticks as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very, I mean, the, the debut was the best of the three, but I think all three albums are really, really good. Yeah. Good band. Yeah. Interesting. I'm, 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 partial, I'm partial to this one, but it's because it's it's a bit more poppy. But um, in that vein, we were talking about it with a pre is being like a precursor to where Asia went. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. GTR and, and other prog groups yep. that did yep. those more pop element albums, um, simplifying it down. Um, I feel like that's what New England was. But coming out in 1979, had they come out after Asia? I think they'd have been huge. Yeah, yeah, I think so. They just it's weren't. Funny how yeah, you, know, you bring up Asia. I think a lot of people give Asia all this, all the credit for you know spearheading that whole melodic rock thing. But as we're talking about, this stuff was happening yeah. way before yeah. Asia. Oh Asia yeah, didn't create that at all. No, they just had the had the name yeah of who was in, in the group. You know, bringing yeah. on you know former oh well, yeah. the super group. Yeah, yeah right. that helped. They could push that, promote it. Right. Yeah. And 79 is kind of the apex of this whole movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you think about the industry in 79, there was so much upheaval. There's so much turmoil. Right. Things were happening, man. After the pistols broke in the UK, it, right. you know, it, we, it didn't really do anything in the US, but the ripple effect, all of a sudden, a kid like me who grew up on Yes, Genesis and Emerson, Lake and Palmer is listening to Joe Jackson, Elvis Costello, The Police, The Talking Heads, XTC, there had been a seismic change in the world. So, you know, a band like New England comes around. It might not be exactly the right album at the right time. A couple right. years later, retooled it as Asia and boom, takes over the world. Again, another example of a band just putting out a fantastic record, maybe at the, at the wrong time, a couple years too early. Yeah. That seems to be the theme for this whole episode, right? Yeah. These bands that were great, but yet just when they did this whole pomp rock thing just kind of didn't really fit into anywhere. And so many of these bands were like off by two or three years when really their music might have fit before or after when they first came out, you know? And I was going to say like New England, the single <laughs> Don't Ever Want to Lose You. Think about it. We're talking 1979. The Knacks come out. Yep. Power Pop is Blondie. going in. Don't. Yep. Yeah. Bars. That song is a power pop classic that's an anthem mm -hmm. and it fit right in that's probably why they got a hit that's probably why it went to number 40 i don't think this record i don't think anything in their catalog really sold no but uh the first album sold okay i think uh yeah the the second and third did nothing didn't it go to the cut i remember seeing cutouts Oh yeah, they were cut New out. England album. Oh, they were cutouts. Yeah, <laughs> lots of cutouts. A lot of cutouts. Yeah. Speaking of discogs, you could probably find a lot of the uh, cutout albums on discogs right now if you go. Oh, right yeah. And, you know. yeah. All right, we got two more to cover, so let's move on to Trillion. Uh, someone got one to that that first album cover, man, a classic. That, absolutely great record. Uh, this, this is the album I'm going to recommend hands down out of everything we talk about today. To me, right. this one epitomizes pop rock. What was cool at the time was about half of them went out on blue vine. Ooh, nice. Oh, look at that. So you didn't really know you, you as a little kid, you came home, you, you took it home and you got your subcolored wax. You had no idea. It, it was awesome. I love this album. You're right. It's just amazing. I, I, they did a second album, right? Yeah. Um, but they had a different singer and yeah. uh, I don't like him as much. But uh, this here, oh, this but, album cover, come on. Yeah, I like both of them. Awesome. Kirby Fredrickson from Toto is yep. singing yeah. on this. So, I mean, that, that was incredible. It, it drew me yes. into incredible. it when, you know, going back after the fact and enjoying the Toto stuff. And, oh, this guy makes a uh, another record. Who's Trillion? But look at that album cover. And yeah. I said, I'm going to give it a shot. And, and this is an album I go back to. It's just the, the opening track, Hold Out into Big Boy. Give me your money, honey. Like, boy. oh my God, it is just so good. One track after the other. And it is so big, so over the top, so much she's in it, but it's just good. I just love it. This album here. I talk about it all the time on my channel. Whenever I do the, you know, five obscure albums of this or that, or, or lost albums that people should find. 
for me, it's always this one. You guys ever, you guys, I always got a kind of, um, the quirky nature of the songwriting on this album and the arranging reminds me a little bit of the tubes at times. I can see that. Which is another yeah. band that we could talk about on the show because yeah. the tubes are there. Like, what the hell are the tubes, right? It's yeah. not yeah. a great band. Definitely but the I get, later I get stuff from them. Love Bomb. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. We looked not at Love Bomb on, on my channel. That's yeah. right. So, we got yeah. to cover them. <laughs> if if there was an epicenter, Pete Pardo, for pop rock, yeah, worldwide, you would probably have to put the bullseye right there somewhere in the middle of the state of Illinois, right? Yeah. You you just have to with Sticks Sticks. and Star Castle and yeah. Trillion Falls yeah. right yeah. into oh, that mix, man. Just amazing. I love this album so much. Uh, Pat Leonard, uh, yeah. the keyboard player. Uh, dude, I, he's so good. He goes on and works with Madonna. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you Madonna don't just Joby. work with Madonna if you're a scrub, right? right. And like you said, uh, Fergie Fredrickson working with Survivor, working with Toto. This is a band that has some serious talent in it. Yeah. Uh, it it's almost uh, hard to think about how good and how far this band could have gone. This is 1978, this first album came out. And then they yeah. put out that second album in 1980. And I guess that was it. Uh, yeah. it one of those great that. what could have been yeah. stories. Because uh, there was talent. There was songwriting. I love I love the uh, debut album a lot. Um, unbelievably good. Have you checked yeah. out the second one now? I have. I, I, I used to have it. I, I don't have it anymore. But uh, maybe I should give it another listen. It's been a while. I it's bought good. it just because I'm a completist and all, but yeah. it does not sound, in my opinion, anything like this. No, it's, it's not nearly. Very even keel, none of the pomp that's in. It's a good album, right? but I can see why they faded after this. And I can see a piece of a band yeah. changing not only front men, but style. And I so remember it sounded very much like the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. They probably didn't, you know, uh, <laughs> make enough of an impact on that first album. And so they said, oh, let's retool it a bit for this. And then it was like, that did even less. And it's kind of faded away, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it's more how polished, most... but, yeah. you know, yeah. they refined their sound a bit more. But that's a, what a lot of these bands did. You mm -hmm. look at their catalogs. They never stay in one place. Usually uh, they like refine that. it to the like point the where... Uh, and develop yeah. but you got to retain who you are um, i think most of these bands didn't stick around long enough to right. go True. further right other Trillion than that, was just you know, a blip yeah, yeah Trillion was a blip aviator was a blip you know angel new england was kind of a blip uh angel was a along the career um <laughs> magnum obviously is a different story but the, even the band we're going to talk about now to finish the episode off i mean these these bands two one two three albums that's it goodbye yep yeah so we got Zahn up in Canada, another in perfect example of this, right? We have that dynamite first album. Right. Guys and wearing a white suit, walking down an escalator, picking up a guitar. Come on. Up I love that. Right? That just screams <laughs> pop. I need that second record. I love that first one. But it, I have it, not heard. It's oh a twofer. Yeah, go get the twofer is still available, Grant. You should get that. Oh, yeah. I've got, what I've got is the I rock candy the version. Rock. Okay. Yeah, God. Oh God. crap! Why do I keep thinking I'm going to spend a lot of money today? <laughs> I hate everybody but, uh, on this. Second panel. album was part of this two for on Escape Records. Yeah. Oh, so I have to God. keep this in the collection just for that album until it gets reissued. Yeah. But I popped Didn't... this on earlier, and I don't know, man. It really grabbed me again. I hadn't it's listened really to it so long, and I was just I trying to refresh my memory before we started up here. And I sat there, and I was just like wow, this is really good. Like, I'm going to be listening to this for the rest of the day. Yeah. And I just, I love that. When you haven't listened to something for a little while, you know it was a good album. It hit you at some point, but you throw it back on and it blows your mind years later. Like, hey, you just, Rick, why didn't this explode? Rick Emmett doesn't mess around with Scrubs. And this yeah. band came from the ashes of a band called Act Three, who okay. one of the members was uh, some dude named Rick Emmett who... Later on, form some <laughs> band named Triumph. Maybe you heard of. Not all Canadian bands disappear into obscurity. Some of them actually become worldwide. And uh, yeah, Zahn wasn't one of them. Man, the rest of Act Three go on and form Zahn. But this Astral Projector album from 1978, man, it's so good. 
Uh, I had it on in the background of an episode not too long ago, and uh, some guy uh, called me and was like, man, I was a guitar player uh, with Rick in Act 3, and oh. I know Howard, uh, the keyboard player for Zahn, and, you know, th so they're all still doing stuff, I guess, musically at, uh, at this point, but uh, I guess Denton Young, the vocalist, uh, he still works with Rick Emmett. Uh, from time to time and I guess there's been talk of reunions and stuff with Zahn but uh, that first album is fantastic the second album Back Down to Earth uh, 1979 almost as good yeah, yeah. I listened to that this morning fantastic I like that and second then, one the best and, and then they got booted they had a three record deal oh uh, but they got the heave ho uh, what were they on Electra I think I think you're and, on Electra and they got yeah, the uh, yeah. no third album uh, for you. So some Canadian label picked it up and it didn't do uh, quite as good. And uh, and that was the end of Zahn, unfortunately. But some of the guys went on and did some other stuff. Howard Helm, the keyboard player, went on to work with uh, uh, Mick Ronson and Ian Hunter. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, remember Seven Mary Three? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess he was like their touring keyboard player. Wow. I have become <laughs> cumbersome. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love it when uh, you know quality people still get work in the music industry. But well, that, that right. first album was fantastic, Pete Pardo. I love it. That I'm giving it a nine out of ten. Astral Projector. Fantastic. That uh, the first album to me is almost like a long lost Sticks album. It is. Yeah. It does sound like sticks. You listen to all these, there's a lot of sticks elements in all these records, oh, yeah. but not quite like this one. Yeah. This is oh my god. Yeah. What do you Wonderful. think of the album art on this? I always thought this was Core. a album cover. So I, I look at it and I say back then when when the visual aspect was your record and the occasional publication in a magazine, um, this is all all people had to go on. Yeah. What, what's on the back of your album cover? Yeah, it's not. Know, it's not not what's. You got on a it. picture, which is cool. Okay, it does have a photo. Okay, eh, it looks kind of pretty basic there, but it's like, it's like if you, you had to go on, I don't know that I would have said, "Let me give them a try." I don't think they were getting a lot of radio play at the time. That's better. That should have been the album cover. That should have been. Yeah, it's like Jafria, kind of like that. That should have yeah. been the album cover. Oh, what is a Zon? <laughs> it's a weird name for a band i know yes. right so it's like the name you know didn't mean anything the album artwork's kind of weird um I, a lot of it comes down to marketing and how bands are presented because that's all anyone had to go on we didn't have the internet and stuff mtv didn't exist just yet so you know i don't know when they started doing like what was it uh friday night tracks or whatever those uh, things were, you know, that you could occasionally see your rock bands on uh, in the late 70s, very early 80s. But um, if this is all they had, yeah. I look at this and I say, I think a big part of it was the visual. Oh, I 100% on a lot of these records. Yeah. yeah and I timing. About Again, timing. Timing yeah. everything. Yeah, timing yeah. everything. I have a question about I'm Worried About the Boys from 1980. That came out on Falcon. Yeah. Was that record recorded for electra or was that recorded after because they you said they were dropped yeah yeah i mean was that do you know anything about that i do not i do not my guess would be is that they were probably starting working in the in the writing process probably hadn't gotten to uh any of the recording yet but i could be wrong and have you guys noticed that a lot of these bands only had like a two record album deal yeah three at the most and that's it yeah, I mean, not enough time for these bands to develop, at least not, you know, bands from the 70s. You know, today, of course, if you don't make your big push right on album number one, you're out. But back then it was like a development thing. Mm -hmm. and look at some of some of the, the bands, you know, that Pink Floyd or, or uh, Deep Purple even. It's like, yeah, they had a little success on the first couple albums, but Deep Purple, man, if uh, Machine Head was what their fifth or sixth album. And it's like if, if they had gotten dropped after two albums, that we'd never hear about Deep Purple. Yeah, yeah. First it was getting albums even. It's like it was getting really, really expensive to break a band by the late seventies. Things had changed in the early seventies. Uh, the market still wasn't mature, 
And mm-hmm. you could break a band with a little bit of effort as a label head. Uh, but going into the late seventies, it became a very expensive proposition to break bands. There was so much competition out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we were right at the tail end of the deregularization of FCC changes and everything changed and it became a real rat race. So yeah, bands weren't getting those long-term deals anymore. And as we saw with Zahn, even if you got a three record deal, that, that could mean a two record deal in actuality. Yeah. No mm-hmm. time to develop whatsoever. Plus, you know, we have to think about as we near the end of this, the decade in the 70s, right? You already had this the, the punk movement. You had the disco movement was in full swing. So I think a lot of record labels were leery of giving long-term contracts to bands, not knowing where music was going to go in the 80s. So let's not sign a pop band or a heavy rock band to a four or five album deal in 1978 or 79, because we don't know what the musical landscape is going to be like in oh. years. Because we've seen, well, you know, new, new, new Wave was already fairly popular, right? So you had punk, new wave, disco, all happening. Prague is dead. Hard rock is dead, right? So where do we go with this stuff? Yeah. So, it's True. not surprising that the record label is like, eh, we'll see what you can do with an album or two. If you don't make it big, goodbye. Right. See, that's scrambling. what all these bands, that's what happened. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. trying to think of really in that time period, show me a band that had a lot of longevity that really came out. I mean, I mean in this type of, did. <laughs> well, but they did have success. But not here. Well, you're right, but they didn't have success, but I mean, they started in the late seventies and have continued ever since. They never broke up within that that time frame. Right. So the well, they stuck period, to it, but um, but they were also on a lot of different labels. You know, that's just the drive of the band that chose to do it. Any one of these bands could have continued, gone to different labels, you know, change the name, do whatever. But they didn't all do that. Magnum chose to do that, and they're well up until recently still around today. Yeah, uh, kind of a thing. But you have to, Angel had a good run. You have to admit they that. Did. Angel they had a really yeah. good run. Yeah. It didn't quite click. Yeah. No, that, that's a shame. Click, right? Angel, Angel, I think, should have. Uh, oh, they should just, have. Like I said, I really think that if Angel debuted in 81 or 82 and yeah. released all those same albums, we might be talking about them a little bit differently today. But yeah. who knows? Yeah. Who knows? A lot of these bands, you think about it, you look at the old reviews, a lot of these bands didn't get very good reviews either. No. You no. know? Yeah, Critics, New England you know. was slaughtered. Mm-hmm. I mean, it they hated that record, and that that's didn't a, help yeah. them either. But God, that's listen to that. Line. You're right. I, I don't think the critics liked any of these bands I we don't talked think they about. They liked any they of them. Hated them all. <laughs> so they, they were like doomed. Dinosaur music. It, you know, progressive yeah. rock was dead. It, it, you know, pomp rock. I don't even know if that was a name used at that time. No, it, so. But that style listen to it and it's like people are going to say well that's progressive rock it's dead you know this three chord punk rock or new wave or new romantics or post-punk you know that was the new fresh stuff and so the critics were slaughtering the the oh yeah i mean just look at some of the bands that made it big at this time so we talked about sticks a couple times in this episode critics hated sticks sticks. critics hated kansas yeah. Yep. Like the critics hated like Ario Speedwagon and Toto and all these other, but they hated them. Yeah. So they, they, didn't, they didn't sound like Joy Division. They had already made it, but Kansas and Sticks and stuff had already made it big. They could right. weather through the late 70s, early 80s, where those albums weren't doing much for them and then make a comeback. I mean, Kansas, it took a long time into almost mm-hmm. the late 90s, early 2000s to really reestablish themselves just as a classic band. Um, but uh, newer bands, as we saw, we just covered six of them here, coming out in that time frame of the late 70s, very early 80s, couldn't establish themselves. Yeah. There wasn't any foothold of that particular style to really get a, get a hold of. If you weren't already Sticks, Kansas, some Queen, you know, you were just being compared to them. Yeah, and the world was changing, you know. <laughs> Like Pete said, punk and disco had already been unfurled, but, you know, the rock music that would go forward and and be super popular in the 80s didn't sound like the rock music that was super popular in the 70s. You know, things were changing and, uh, yeah, there were winners and there were losers. And all these great bands we just talked about today, uh, history has probably forgotten about them all, but we haven't because good music is good music. (laughs) Not us, because we don't care 
what it is. You, ha- you have to give Stick some props. I'm going to give Dennis DeYoung. He knew what to do with them, whether you like that stuff. But look, he was able to take them through the early 80s, and they were selling records. They yeah. were having hit singles. And had they not imploded, you know, right. who knows? Yeah. Hey, I, you know, I just I talked about it on my morning show this morning. So Cornerstone in 1979 oh. sold 3 yeah. million copies. Mm-hmm. Paradise Theater sold millions of copies kilroy sold millions of copies it was a big record yeah yeah, yeah. and it's... nobody wants to admit that today no you know it's a, to a lot of people sticks were a joke right they yeah. were not a joke no sticks they had a run from record. grand delusion to kilroy all million selling albums lots of hit singles they were big songs that are still played on fm classic rock radio today they so we, we have to give no. dennis d young his credit and uh, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that if we were going to coronate one individual as the king of pop rock, oh, it is you, <laughs> sir. It is. I you. would. I wouldn't argue that at all. <laughs> I, I, you are I the second, absolute king of pop rock. <laughs> I second. But that. we have to give Dennis some more props because Pete and I looked at the Dennis Young catalog and those Frontiers albums. The last two records that he did, awesome, go so good, absolutely awesome. Awesome. They're great. They're so great. If you have this preconception of Dennis, please go check out those Frontiers yeah. records. Yeah. Please. Yeah. It's like the last two Sticks albums. Yes. Phenomenal. The last two Dennis D. Young albums, man. We're spoiled. We're spoiled we, for we should... pop rock greatness well, in 2020. Well, like what Pete said, instead of people complaining about it that Dennis isn't in Sticks, yeah. look what we got. We got four great four records. Instead of two. Yeah. We got four great albums. That's better. Four great two. albums. Yeah. So <laughs> embrace it. You know. Yeah, that's right. But notice how this conversation always comes back to sticks. It has to. It's oh, rock. It. But there's so much sticks on these records. Yes. I know there it is. It all goes. It all goes back to sticks. It all goes back to sticks. Yep. Nothing wrong with that. That, wrong that, with that. that should be the title of a future video we do. It all there goes back go. to sticks. It all goes back to sticks, right? <laughs> You know, I still love that on album. all of these, and I, I don't, I don't think these bands were specifically trying to rip them off. It's just that that's that's a style mm-hmm. there. That's a it's a yeah. really good. It's all about the influence, right? It's all about yeah. you know before all this stuff was coming out, you had you had Crystal Equinox, Crystal Ball, Grand Illusion, and Pieces of Eight, right yeah. there. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, uh, quite a run, right? That's mm-hmm. not talking about the cornerstone and going forward. So, and a lot of bands don't have runs like that. No, no. Most bands don't have four albums I consider perfect. And yeah, Equinox to Pieces of Eight, yeah. Flawless, 10 out well, of 10. I still it's like Cornerstone. I like all that crap. I like Cornerstone, I like Cornerstone and Paradise <laughs> yeah, Theater. No, Paradise, too, but, Paradise but, Theater. Uh, it's good. It's all yeah. good. It's all, yeah, it good. it's all good. I love it. So for uh, those of you watching, uh, obviously, if you haven't heard any of these bands, uh, you've got some listening to do. I would highly recommend any of them and all of them. Uh, there's some great stuff here. If you are familiar with them, uh, let us know what you think of some of these groups down in the comments below. And uh, for our next episode together, we decided this right before we started recording this one, we are going to dedicate the entire episode to one band that probably when you think of uh, a band's music that you can't even categorize, this band always comes up. And we're going to talk about him for like an hour or however long it takes. Uh, We're going to talk about Steely Dan and nothing but Steely Dan our next episode. What is Steely Dan? Is it rock? Is it funk? Is it jazz? Is it jazz rock? Is it pop? Is it, uh, I I don't know. We'll get down to it, though. We'll get down to it. We, We don't know what it is or what they are. But we know we love them, and we're going to talk about them. So for all you Steely Dan fans, it's going to be an an hour or so discussion on our love for Steely Dan and trying to figure out what the hell they're all about and what what the music is, because that's what we do on this show. What is it, right? So till next time, uh, everybody give uh, Brendan uh, what's coming up, uh, what's new on your, exciting on your channel. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow I've got a uh, review of the new police box set Synchronicity going up, and then uh, right after that, an album ranking for Deep Purple on there so stick around check that out head over to my channel you can just find me under my name yeah because we got the brand new album had it so that everybody wants to know where does equal one fit into the the ranking now i think i yeah. did i did a ranking the album show of deep purple years ago so i think i've got two albums that aren't included in that maybe three oh, maybe i update it it's been a while yeah <laughs> you have like, to update it 23 oh. albums that, that took a while yeah. <laughs> oh man i know grant how about you all right 
Uh, well, tomorrow night, Mr. Pardo will be in the warehouse, and we will be playing two hours of Yacht Rock. No. So brace yourselves. This is part two. The first yeah. episode that we did was so popular that everybody said, are you going to do two? And I, I said, let's do two. And Pete graciously said, we'll be getting our summertime it. yacht art outfits on. We'll have a couple cold drinks and we're just going to be spinning tunes, right? And I'm working on it right now and it's going to be phenomenal. So we want to hear from everybody in the chat. Keep it loose. We're talking music over there. And on the contrarians, we always have something coming out. Uh, I'm working on, we did a show ranking, believe it or not, I don't think we have ever done that before, but someone suggested part of the Patreon uh, member suggested doing a ranking of cheap trick songs. And I went, oh, yeah. well, baby, I'm down for that. Let's do yeah. that. So uh, I'm working on that. And of course the Wednesday live chat, we didn't have one last week. We are going to have one this week. Martin won't be there, uh, but we've got some other people filling in so we will be doing the live chat on wednesday at 7 p.m eastern time cool scott when are we doing when, when are we posting this pete pardo saturday evening okay well i then i can push sunday's sunday prog stream this <laughs> sunday yeah one o'clock eastern we're doing the top 10 opeth songs so that's going to be a lot of fun uh, I got some edumacating to do. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of those uh, Cookie Monster vocals. So uh, you should have invited someone who knows a lot about the Cookie Monster era. Um, hint, hint. Yes, indeed. But, but that's Sunday. That's Sunday right there. And then all week long. Well, really, I'm going to be doing a whole month of uh, Charisma Records uh, type of content. I'm interviewing. You're going to like this, Pete Pardo. Uh, my interview with Two's Mork, the brand new Two's Mork album comes out next month. That's right. My with them, it's Monday. And then uh, Tuesday, my interview with uh, the lead singer for Wobbler. Oh, Andres Prestmo, one of my favorite singers uh, from Wobbler and the Chronicles of Father Robin. Uh, we'll be doing all kinds of Scandinavian uh, type content. Norwegian specifically, because... Uh, Honestly, Charisma Records is on fire right now. Uh, the new Ritual album comes out next month. The new album by Mir. The Twosmark album, the Airbag album just came out. Uh, Charisma Records is on fire. Seven and Pale. Uh, such a great label. So we're going to be talking about that stuff pretty much for the next month. So if you don't like Scandinavian Prague, I guess the Prague Corner is not the place for you for the next <laughs> month. So you know, go, go watch somebody else's channel because that's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> watch brandon's channel <laughs> yeah i mean i'm telling you charisma pollen man it's like they're they're, they're just pumping out also the, the music coming out of scandinavia right now on the prog scene is just, yeah. is just out of cool. as as good as the new twos mark is beat part of it's the new ritual that has my heart oh we're going to be talking about this i'll be interviewing uh, patrick lundstrom uh, from Ritual and their brand new album, The Story of Mr. Bogged, Part One. Spoiler alert! It's the best album of 2024. So yeah, we got a we got a lot of stuff we're going to be doing here in uh, the next uh, few weeks on the Prog Corner. A lot of fun. Good stuff. Sounds good. Uh, what do we got coming up here? So tomorrow here on Ranking the Albums on the channel, we will be uh, I'll be joined by Mr. George Lemmy and we will be ranking the albums of King Diamond. That's coming up tomorrow. And then Tuesday on In the Prog Seat, we're going to be doing another album war. We've got the debut albums in a battle from Steve Hackett, Tony Banks, Michael Rutherford and Peter Gabriel going head to head. Who will win that? Mm. Just you wait and see. That's mm. coming up on Tuesday. Oh. I have to mention something else. Speaking of George Lemmy, premiering, well, it'll premiere yesterday. Wait a minute. You said this yeah. came out. Okay. It'll premiere tonight, which would be yesterday. George Lemmy came on the show and, and we looked at the, we did a career retrospective on the band Mr. Bungle. Now oh. I've been trying to get someone to talk Mr. Bungle. He's the man. Year, He's the man. And evidently Chuck Alvarez is also a Bungle person. And I did not know that, but George and I talked Bungle and that is some catalog. I'm just going to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Just trying to turn you on stuff, but I'm glad you mentioned George because he will be on uh, in the warehouse. So wow. that's, good. that's good. You got the right Tim diamond and Mr. Bungle. We got great content on these channels. Who's talking Mr. Bungle. 
right? <laughs> who's talking yeah, Mr. Bungle? Who's talking Zahn? Who's talking Ritual and Two's Mark? Right. And it's, I mean, come on. That's right. Here we go. What more do you want? <laughs> I'm telling you, crazy stuff. So, uh, so check out all this stuff that's happening, and we'll see you here in a couple of weeks on what is it? Steely Dan's next. Till then, for Brendan Snyder, Grant Arthur, and Scott Lade, I am P. Pardo. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, everybody. See you tomorrow. Ranking the albums, King Diamond. Till then, take care. Bye bye. See you. See you guys.